Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. It's Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council update. Boy, I missed that. I miss saying that. Um, this time, we're going to talk a little bit about how to stockpile grass. Uh, as the time has went on here, um, Beth and I and some of y'all uh, belong to a grazing group on Facebook called the Regenerative Grazing Group. And a couple weeks ago, somebody posted the question, how do you stockpile grass? And of course, my smart aleck self, I said, well, that's really easy to set some grass aside and then you graze it in a time of need. But as the comments came in and as I thought about the question a little while longer, I thought, you know, that's a really simple question with some really complex answers. And it goes right along with the things that I've been doing recently. Uh, you know, you all know that I, I like to do year end in reviews and 2020 kind of spilled into 2021 for year end review for me. And uh, I've, I've been working on some ways that maybe we could stockpile grass a little better at my own farm. And I think some of them relate to all of what you were doing and maybe it'll help you to stockpile some more grass. Uh, you know, for many years we've been mob grazing at the farm and we thought that would be the ticket. We would get there. We could get some more stockpiled grass. We'd be able to graze our whole herd through the winter time. And as time went on, it has improved our stockpiled situation. We have been able to get some groups of livestock through the entire winter without hay, but we have by no means got to the point where we've got all of our livestock through the winter. So I thought it was a good review to look at how to stockpile grass and maybe think of some other systems and some other ways, to, maybe some benchmarks that we need to hit uh, to be able to ensure we get the maximum amount of stockpile grass we can. So let's get started. First, I think it's real important to look at what what maybe we, what we've been doing wrong in the past few years. And I by no means am saying that y'all have been doing it wrong, but what I'm saying is what I've been doing is wrong. And I think if we're going to correct the problem, we got to first admit what we've done wrong in the past. And for us, for me at home, every year the spring flush gets here and it feels like the party's never going to end. Like we've got so much grass, we don't know where this all came from. We don't know how we got so much and. We're not wanting to do anything to get it to go away. Uh, every year I talk to producers and say, oh, I've never had this much grass before in that May to June time frame," And we just get that under control like we talk about all the time. We talk about controlling the spring flush and controlling the seed heads and keeping the grass vegetative. We just get that under control and we think, all right, I'm going to stockpile some grass this year. I'm going to set this aside for stockpile. And then what happens? Well, what happens is July and August get here and things slow down and the grass isn't growing as fast. And all of a sudden, the portion that we've left that we're grazing is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Every time we make a rotation, it's less grass than the next rotation as it was the one previous. So we start dipping into that stockpile. Well, I'm just gonna take a little bit of this. And and, and then the, the grass that we've left and we're still grazing, it, it'll be okay, it'll grow back. And in the next rotation, we do the same thing. We dip into that stockpile just a little bit more. And, and for me, typically, I end up dipping into it enough that I pretty much rendered it useless by the end of the grazing season, and I've got no stockpile left to go. And it seems like we just continue to do that year after year after year. We repeat the same mistakes. And so this presentation is dedicated to kind of going through uh, what we can do to maybe get out of that rut, to get out of that problem and, and maybe stockpile grass a little better in the future. So thinking about those problems and how we've done it in the past, now thinking toward how can we turn that around? How can we make our mistakes an opportunity? And I kind of got inspired by a, an article that came out in the Beef Team newsletter from Chris Penrose called Our Best Winter Forage Maybe Stockpiled Fescue. And this is just one of the many things that inspired me to go on this deep dive and looking at what, we, what we've done wrong with stockpile and how to make things better. But it was one of the better ones that, that I kind of came across. And, it talked about Ohio State University success with stockpiling grass with and without nitrogen and what yields they were seeing at the East Ohio Re um, Regional Research Facility down there in Bell Valley and gave me some real hard numbers to work with uh, as far as what they'd seen in their research. So I got to thinking, can I work a system out on paper that would help us out? And at NRCS, we've got a program called Graze 5. We've been using it for years and and honestly, for those of us that are NRCS and listening in, you probably think, well, love it or hate it, we still have Grace 5. And, and I say all the time that Grace 5 is the best bad modeling system we've got to be able to figure out a grazing system. But it is, it is the only modeling system that we currently have that really does a good job of figuring out 
uh, what a grazing system is going to look like, how much forage it's going to produce, and how much forage it's going to need. So I thought, well, I'll take that graze five, and, and maybe we'll we'll try to use it to, to model out a system that might help us to better manage our forage to gain some stockpiled grass. So when I initially started this model farm idea, I was just going to use my farm, 104 acres of grass, average yield somewhere around 6,000 pounds per acre. But as I thought about it, I said, you know, my farm really isn't going to give us give me the numbers. I was hoping to to get to a place where I had some percentages and some hard numbers that I could share with all of you to be able to, to give me an idea or give us an idea of, of the way we ought to go about stockpiling grass better. So I came up with this idea of let's, let's just use a model farm. So in my model farm idea, I, I just picked 100 acres. That's the typical grazing operation I work with. I picked a typical yield, 6,650 pounds of forage uh, produced per acre annually. I know that sounds like a weird number, but I just averaged a bunch of typical grazing soils together, and that's the one I came up with. And then I balanced the animal numbers to the total forage produced for that operation, meaning I took the, the total forage production for that 100 acres at 6,650, which you know, those of you that are following along, that's 665,000 pounds of forage, and just figured out how many cows I could have on my model farm with a May or June birth date to consume all of that forage. Of course, with the utilization rate in there at about 75%, uh, I, I, I wanted to have a 335-day grazing system. and, and figured on feed and hay for 30 days. I figured this was a good system. And from my past presentations and my past work, I've always figured that it was better probably to feed hay for at least 30 days to get us through snow or ice or really deep mud efficiently as far as cost goes and cost savings goes. You don't really save a lot by grazing through the entire winter. It is actually a little more efficient to feed some hay. So first I ran this system cow calf a cow calf operation of course including some heifers you can see it listed there and one bull but the numbers i found were kind of cool and but they didn't really match my operation and, and knowing that the, the differences in operations are so varied among the people that we talk with i said well i'm going to go ahead and run it for, for what would look more like my operation which is a grass finished operation we've got cows and we finished the calves all the way through to finish so i ran it with cow calf and compared the two numbers together and they were so interesting. I said, well, I'm gonna go ahead and try to run it for sheep. So I ran an operation with ewes and feeders. I ran another one with ewes and fats. And finally, just for fun, after I run all the numbers, I said, well, you know, I need to compare this to a fall calving operation or a winter calving operation. So if you count along at home, I actually ran the model six different times, but, but I wanted to get an idea, again, if there were any benchmarks, if there was anything we could kind of hang our hat on, that would help us produce stockpiled forage. So this is the chart that I came up with after running all those different models. And it's kind of busy, I know, and it's hard to understand, but just to show you that I did run all the different models and this is what it is. The green line represents our typical forage curve. It represents how our forage typically grows. And then the other lines correspond with the bottom of the screen there, uh, what operation they were. The blue line, of course, is your typical spring calving, May, June calving, feeder calf operation. The red line is a winter calving, so January calving. The brown line is a fall calving operation, calving sometime in September. And the other ones fill in there uh, as well. But it just gives you an idea for, for the variation in the forage need of each of those operations. The one take-home point from this chart, though, was look at how much they actually stay the same. They're all within that eight, 80,000 to 40,000 pound range. They don't, they very rarely dip below and they very rarely go above. Um, there's a lot of variation within those operations, don't get me wrong, but they sure stay pretty consistent, especially if you throw out the winter calving and the fall calving, the, the numbers and the lines stay very consistent. So I think I was able to use this to draw some conclusions about how we manage our grass and how it might help us to gain some stockpile grass. So my hope in, in putting all these models together was that, that I could find some relatable percentages across the host of different operations, some numbers. You know, so often us as professionals ha have a hard time sticking our neck out and putting hard numbers to things. And, and, and that's all well and good, but it sure does make it hard for a producer to follow a roadmap. 
to kind of follow or get an idea. And I wanted to put some percentages together, some numbers together that was kind of a guide, somewhere we could start. I'm not saying by any means the percentage or the numbers I'm about to show you are right or they're correct for your operation. What I'm saying is it's a good starting point. It might be a good starting point or something to work toward or just something to think about. I, I, I hate that we don't provide a number or a roadmap. And here I, I've been grazing for almost 20 years before I even thought of this, before I even thought of thinking of a roadmap. And the reason was because I had never been shown one, really. I've been told about things, but I'd never really started in and looked for one. I started out to prove that I could set aside uh, an area of the pasture from April to August and then graze that area from August to November 1st, our typical end of growing season, while allowing the rest of our farm to stockpile. And, and hopefully I could set an area aside and let the rest of the farm stockpile and I would have enough stockpile then to graze through most of the winter, minus 30 days or, or so. My initial try at that said it wasn't going to work but as I kept working with the models I found a way for it to work and we'll talk about that in a minute and but that was the initial reason why I started these but in the end it showed me so much more there were so many more relatable numbers and so many more things that I, I guess I hadn't realized and I hadn't thought about it, it gave me some benchmarks some things that I think we can use going forward to help us stockpile grass uh, and, and I discovered some different systems that might help us produce stockpile in the end I wanted to come up with a couple different systems to fit different operations and the different managements and the varied managements that we, we talk to and people that we work with. So these are just some numbers and, and, and I'm kind of getting deep in the weeds here with numbers, but uh, I put these all on the screen because I wanted to show my, my one true aha moment when putting the, all these models together. As I did the models and I compared the numbers together, the real important thing that I found was this 33% of the forage needs of our typical herd that's in balance forage wise, 33% of their forage needs comes between August 1st and November 15th. That's our typical stockpile time. That's when we're typically growing stockpile grass. And then down below, 32% of the yearly production, our forage production, 32% of our yearly forage production happens between August 1st and November 15th. So if I balance that operation out, we can draw a conclusion here. 33% is needed when we're producing 32% of our forage. That was my first aha moment. The livestock are eating the same percentage that is produced in the fall. No wonder we have trouble producing stockpiled forage. Our livestock are eating the exact amount of forage that we need to be stockpiling. So many times we set aside and think, oh, I can great leave this for stockpile grass and we'll be fine. When if our operation is in balance with the forage production, our, our livestock are eating the same amount that we're producing in that fall typical stockpiling period. So we're gonna get into some of the benchmarks, other things that I've come up with with doing the models. And I'd love to work through all those models with you and show you all the different numbers. We're talking about a two year labor of love here, but it, it just in the interest of time, it's easier to tell you the things that I've kind of found. And, and I, I chose to call them benchmarks. I got some surveying background and, and benchmarks is something hard to tie back to. And it's something I like to look back at and, and figure out exactly what works and what doesn't, but having something hard and fast and a, and a rule to go by. We need to pay attention to the forage curve and your forage needs curve. I think too often us as professionals haven't done a good job at showing you those forage curves and how they grow and also your forage curve. You know, we talk about a cow eating 3% of her body weight, but that varies, it fluctuates so much depending on where she's at in calving and in lactation. And, and I think, it would do us a good service for all of us to sit down and look at our forage needs curve. How long do we keep the calves? How much are they eating? When are they affecting our forage needs? And then I think we need to try to get our animals numbers in balance with the forage that we produce. I think too often our operations are not in balance. We've got too many livestock, too many cows, too many ewes, too many steers, whatever it may be. We're not in balance with the forage that we produce. Uh, we think that we want to stockpile grass and we think we want to graze 90 or 120 extra days. But in the end, our, our livestock numbers tell us that we're wrong because we don't want to do that because we've got too many livestock out there. Then we need to try and match our lowest forage need 
with our lowest forage production. Uh, now this may not be easy. It may not work out for us. And, and, and I don't want to beat up on the fall calvers or the winter calvers. You, why you calve when and where you do is totally up to you. I will say though, don't come to me crying because it's not making you any money. We've told you many, many times, we need to match our forage production to our forage needs. And I'm gonna tell you one more time. If we're gonna really think about stockpile grass, we need to be thinking about matching our lowest forage need with our lowest forage production. And conversely, or, or together, our highest forage need with our highest forage production. So that'd be in the springtime, uh, we need to think about matching those things together as much as we can. If we don't, you're a fall caver, winter caver, and you've got a reason for why you do what you do, and, and you've got an economic reason, especially for why you do what you do, then that's okay. Just realize that your operation falls short when it comes to matching those lowest lows and highest highs. Then we need to figure out how much forage we need to get through the dormant season and then work backwards from there. I kind of picked this up from the holistic management um, book, Alan Savory's deal. Um, they talked about, okay, we're gonna produce X number of forage in a year and we need to get through the dormant season. So we need to know how much that number is, get that number grown and then work backwards from there and only graze off what, 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 we, what we can in order to keep that amount to go through the dormant season. That's really easy to do in a really brittle climate, in a desert climate or a dry climate or somewhere you're only going to graze paddocks once a year. It's a little more difficult when you talk about an eastern Ohio pasture that we have such a varied seasons and four different seasons to have to go through and we may go to the, to the same paddock seven or eight or nine or ten times a year. It's a little harder to think about then. So we need to think about how long we want to graze or how long do we want to feed hay. <clears throat> And then know our numbers, know how, how much we need, how much hay we need, how much stockpile grass we need, and stick to it. Kind of make a schedule and go on from there. I wanted to throw these forage graphs, forage curve graphs back up there again. I kind of pulled out some of the data so they weren't so confusing. If you haven't noticed, I figured out how to use line graphs on Excel. and I, I thought it was a pretty interesting tool for us to see, but the left hand graph there is the forage curve of course in green again blue is a, a spring calving cow herd brown or is a fall calving cow herd and red to be a winter calving cow herd and, and then just notice the variation in highs and lows and dips and valleys in those three numbers i also included the the standard just forage curve just to show you how we really have that spring flush in may and june the the, the summer slump in july and august and then a, a fall bump there in october and then one just plain one just that shows the, the typical spring or April, May, June calving cow herd. Uh, that's typically what the forage needs or looks at like versus the forage production. So to continue on here with our benchmarks. So I've talked about or alluded to it before, but our forage will grow two to 3,000 pounds between July 15th and November 15th. That's typical, that's an average. Not every soil type is going to grow that same amount. Not every farm is going to grow that same amount. But our, typically, our, our kind of maximum, really, for East Ohio is two to 3,000 pounds on an average year per acre between July 15th and November 15th. Again, lots of variables go into that. That doesn't mean it's every year. I'm just saying, if we're talking about a typical year, that's the number we're looking at. If our forage needs and forage production are in balance, meaning our, our herd is going to eat the pretty much the same amount of forage that we produce, our herd, our livestock, will also consume two to 3,000 pounds per acre between July 15th and November 15th. So in order to stockpile grass, we really need that two to 3,000 pounds on hand at the start of the stockpile growing period to get the animals through the fall without using our stockpile forages when necessary. So we, we really, if we, we, our maximum for stockpile grass is two to 3,000 pounds. If we want to have two to 3,000 pounds of stockpile grass per acre on November 15th when the growing season ends, we really needed to have two to 3,000 pounds on the 1st of July to be able to graze that. And while it, we were grazing it, it was also regrowing and replenishing that two to 3,000 pounds so that we had it November 15th. I think this is where we go wrong and 
this is my big thing. If you don't take anything home from our presentation, this is the one I want you to take home. That we need that stockpile in July, not November 15th. We're going to we're going to graze it, and, and if we if we start thinking about stockpile August 1st from a zero sum game, we're not going to gain two to three thousand pounds of stockpile by November 15th when the growing season ends. It's just not going to happen. Uh, this was again the big aha moment for us. As we go forward, we graze that two to three thousand pounds. It should regrow, leaving us with the stockpile behind. And I, I'm, I'm going by acres here, by acre numbers, two to three thousand pounds per acre. But I really don't care how you measure it. It doesn't matter whether it's pounds per acre or total pounds needed for the dormant season. If you know you need a hundred thousand pounds to get through the dormant season, you need a hundred thousand pounds starting July 1st, July 15th, somewhere in there, to be able to get there. Part of the benefit of grazing is we don't ever have to start an equipment. We don't ever have to start a tractor to feed livestock. The detriment is we can't turn them off. They have to keep growing. We can't decide July 1st, we're going to just shut the livestock down and let it all stockpile and come November 15th, we'll fire them all back up again and we'll graze through the winter. We can't do that. So we've got to have forage for them to consume while we're also grazing stockpile grass. My estimates, my numbers were we need to have pretty much the same amount. In fact, we probably need to have a little more July 1st through the 15th somewhere in there than our eventual intended stockpile grass at the end. Quick bar graph here just to show you the different different operations and what they what they consume from that July period to that November 15th and the growing season. So the left hand bar is the forage production. If we if we're looking at 6650 pounds per acre on hundred acres, that's the forage production. And each successive bar over is a different operation. So the first one is the the fat cattle, an operation more like mine, 20 cows, 19 fat steers, that's what they would consume. It's pretty even. You move over to the next one, that's cow-calf. If the forage was, was in balance, the cow-calf operation is going to eat more in that July to November period than we produce in that July to November period. That's why I'm saying we need to have a little more July 1st than we do <clears throat> November 15th or than we want to have November 15th. And you can see the rest of those bars as you go across, kind of match them up to your operation. Fall and winter actually look really good here. Um, the, the consumption is about even, with but the production is even less than than the than the, the spring-born kids. But those fall and winter cows will eat more in the winter time. If I had time, I'd show you the bar graph for the winter as well. But we don't produce any forage in the winter, so there's nothing to compare it to. To go on with our benchmarks here, we need to get to those seed heads as fast as humanly possible. We need to keep our pastures vegetated to be able to produce stockpile. And this may mean mob graze them, to clip them, to mow some of it for hay, or even crop roller. And I got a question mark there. Um, Carol Sullivan Water bought a crop roller. I'm interested to try it. See whether I can roll over a pasture and get knock the seed heads out, but not get rid of the grass. It's something interesting, something we've talked about. I, I noticed that when we drive through a field that's about to go to seed with a four-wheeler, if you go back a couple weeks later, there won't be any seed heads in that four-wheeler path where the four-wheeler tires ran over. Maybe we could use a crop roller to help keep our forage from going to a reproductive state. I don't know. It's, so, it's a total experiment. But we need to figure out a way somehow <clears throat> to keep them from producing seed heads as much as humanly possible before we lose the good growing months of May and June. May and June is when we're going to grow the most of our forage. And it doesn't do us any good if that forage has already made a seed head and is already going into reproductive mode. It's not going to produce as much the rest of the year if we allow it to do so. Remember, seed heads are hollow, or I guess I just figured this out. It was about the time I took this picture here. I was mob grazing really tall grass. And some of the pictures following this are this same exact field, not two or three rotations later, and you can see how vegetative it is. I'll probably forget to point it out, but just be watching for it. Uh, seed heads, as, as I pulled them in that field, cut them off, I could almost blow through the seed head, through the stem of the seed head. And I went over and I pulled out some grass leaf and cut it, and the vein in the grass is solid. So, 
that means to me the seed head is easily easily crushed it's easily bent it's easily kinked by livestock pressure the grass blades on the other hand can take some trampling some pressure without killing the veins or without killing the, the grass blade so that's the way that we use high stocking density grazing to control seed heads. And I'm not saying that everybody should control their seed heads by using high stocking density. It, it works for me. It does not work for every operation. But I found that stock densities of 50 to 100,000 pounds have been been effective at controlling the seed heads on forage. Um, <clears throat> we hear about stocking densities of 200,000, 250, 500,000, million pounds per acre. We really don't have to go that high in eastern Ohio. I, I found 50 to 100,000 pounds works out pretty well. And that's a whole other calculation, a whole other thought. If we want to get into that, we can get into it some other time. But also remember, we're never going to get all the seed heads. And that's okay. We should try. We should try to get them all. But not at the expense of the grass or saving grass for the future. If we leave some seed heads out there in the field, the, the livestock are eventually going to consume them especially if they're 10 percent or less when we get to that october time and it gets rainy and the grass kind of gets wet again in november those seed heads are still standing out there our cows our sheep and goats are going to consume those seed heads because they're very dry it's dry matter to help fill in the wet grass that they're taking into their system so it's not a bad thing to leave a few seed heads i know we hate them they look ugly but it really our livestock will consume them in the future we just don't want very many of them. We want to control as much as we could. And quite honestly, there's room for research here. You know, if someone wanted to do research on how many seed heads or what percentage of seed heads we need to knock back to keep our grass vegetative, that would be really useful information. Unfortunately, we didn't have it yet. Remember that seed head production is closely related to the longest day of the year, so June 21st. Once we reach that point, the grass will stop trying to produce the seed head. Now, it'll still try to produce the seed head couple days after the longest day but it's largely centered around that longest day of the year if your grass is already trying to reproduce come July 20th it's going to go ahead and make a seed head but if we've got it knocked back somewhere in the days prior to the longest day of the year and it's recovering from a grazing event typically it won't go ahead and make a seed again for the rest of the season at that point once it doesn't make a seed if we stop the seed head from coming the grass plant kind of says well I guess I better survive until the next season because I'm not going to be reproducing myself to seed this year. And that's what we really want. We want that grass plant to say, hey, I didn't need to make a seed head. I'm not in any danger of dying here. And I can just continue to grow and I can produce through rhizomes or through additional plant growth instead of having to reproduce myself this year. <clears throat> Again, some seed heads left aren't going to hurt. Your livestock will consume them with dry matter later. And then we get this question all the time when it comes to managing early spring growth, especially during that time when the seed heads are just starting to come out. My cows don't graze efficiently. They don't graze uniformly across the landscape. Something I tried, and I wanted to bring it up in this presentation I tried last year. I tried using periodic mob grazing trainings with the cows to keep them non-selective. And so you can see this picture here. That's along the county road. I, I typically don't put the cows in this field at night because I'm afraid of them being close to that county road. We got some places where the fence isn't so close to the ground and calves slip out. So I tried this mob grazing training along this strip. This is also our access from the top of the hill down when we move cows. So I just put the cows in there in that long skinny strip. It's 160 feet long by about 40 feet wide. I put the cows in there for 20 minutes, half an hour, something like that. We were mobbed up really tight, really close, and they grazed across that field and were very non-selective in what they grazed. They just grazed all of it pretty uniformly. And then you can see where the cows are. I moved them across the fence, and they've been in that field almost 12 hours. You can see how uniformly they kind of grazed that. Now, I had been doing these mob trainings with the cows for about five or six days. And that's what the experts kind of tell us. We need to do it for five or six days to teach them not to be selective. And if you see them going back to being selective again after weeks, months, then we can go back and do these kind of mob grazing trainings. It actually worked out well for me because I put them in these small little paddocks, left them while I moved the water trough, while I moved fences, while I built fences, and I came back, moved them out of that little paddock into the bigger paddock they were going to be in for the day. And that, <clears throat> that was 
it was time efficient, I guess. I didn't have to go back out there and move those animals again. But just one way to help train your livestock to not be so selective in their grazing, to graze the field more uniformly. Then to further our benchmarks here, kind of going into fall management. We need long rest periods in the fall when the forages are on slow. Long, slow rest periods. Big paddocks, long, slow rest periods if possible. Now, that's kind of, those are two are kind of counterintuitive. Sometimes it has to be small paddocks, but long rest periods because it takes our forages 60 days or more to grow from a grazing event. Remember that take half, leave half is the maximum we can take, not the goal we should always have. We so often get hung up on take half, leave half, and take half, leave half is um, rather unexplanatory as it is. Take half, leave half really isn't take half the, the height of the plant, it's take half the weight of the plant, which isn't half of the height of the plant. But we just need to know that we take half, leave half is not something we have to do every single time. Take half, leave half works at times in the year. But that doesn't mean that we have to take half leave half every single time, especially not in the, the late summer and early fall when it's not going to make a seed head anyway, or in the fall and winter even when it's not going to make a seed head anyway. We don't have to take half. We simply have to take enough to keep the livestock fed and keep the grass vegetative. That's all we have to do. We don't have to take half every time. We get so caught up in that we're going to run out, we're going to run out, we're going to run out, and we, we hang on to that take half leave half, and we always do it. And then come fall, we don't have enough grass because we haven't left enough forage for it to regrow. And, and we get ourselves in trouble with not having enough stock about grass. And then fall, consider applying nitrogen or manure in the fall to help promote stockpile growth. Uh, even at today's nitrogen prices, it's still worth it. Just doing the quick math uh, from, from that uh, stockpiled article I referenced earlier, you know, 100 pounds of nitrogen right now will run you 46 bucks, 100 pounds to the acre. <clears throat> but... If we put that down, that'll gain us around a thousand pounds of forage. If my math's correct, it's somewhere that makes it somewhere around ninety dollars a ton worth of forage. That's probably worth it if we're going to be stockpiling grass anyway. We're probably better off to go ahead and apply that nitrogen, even at today's prices. If you got manure, if you got other things to apply, it's good to get them applied in the fall, in that fall time period, to help us with our growth and we're going to talk more about that as we get into systems that might help us produce stockpile grass additional benchmarks to help us produce stockpile grass we can't manage what we don't measure <clears throat> and i got a picture here the the uh, rising plate meter <clears throat> and think about it this way uh, we in farming talk all the time about agriculture and you can't beat mother nature and that it, there has never been a truer statement spoken. We can't beat Mother Nature, but we can work with her. And the only way we're going to be efficient and, and get ahead with Mother Nature is by managing what she produces for us, by measuring it, by being efficient and efficient in our use of it. And the only way to do that is to measure what we're producing and what we're using. So we might measure pasture, we need to measure pasture to find our actual production per paddock or per acre. <clears throat> also to realize when the growth is not what we had expected. Boy, if we'd measure our pastures on a regular basis, we would really see that summer slump happen. We would know from one week to the next, whoa, it really slowed down. And then if we measure our pastures too, it would help us to figure out how much we might expect to have for winter. I've already talked about having as much in July as we want to have in November. We're measuring our pastures. We really could have an idea of what we could expect for winter. So often people don't want to stockpile grass or don't think about it because, well, I don't know how much is out there. So I don't know how much hay I'll need to feed. And it's just easier to buy or make all the hay that we need. Uh, if we measure our pastures, we can have an idea how much we have out there. And there's lots of other technology available out there to do this. I've seen videos. Kevin sent me a video of a little deal you could put on your four-wheeler and it sends radar down and measures your forage and, and it clicks to your phone and it'll tell you how much is out there without having to go use a riding, rising plate meter or a grazing stick. And then we need to look at our forage balance in some way, whether it be paper, a computer program, whatever it may be, and compare it to the measurements we have. The last part of this is, I think we really need to work harder at thinking of in terms of production units or AMUs, not necessarily acres. I use the example all the time that at home we got a Steinsberg soil type next to Keen. The Steinsberg produces about two and a half tons of forage a year. The Keen produces about 8,000. 
<clears throat> so that's four ton. So, you know, if, if we're comparing those apples to apples, it takes three or so times the number of acres of Steinsberg soil to produce the same amount as an acre of keen soil. If we think more in production units or AMUs or some other unit of measurement and less in acres, we'd be better off when we're, we're comparing them to the measurements that we're taking out in our pastures. Finally, for benchmarks too, we need to think about adding diversity, specifically legumes to our pasture, but it's not gonna hurt to add some forbs as well. Typically, a lot of our pastures already has some forbs out there, but adding some, some improved forbs isn't gonna hurt. Adding legumes to add nitrogen is gonna really help our, our, our production. Now, I, I'm going over the videos that Bob Henner shot from last month, and he talked about adding diversity and how it had a negatively affected his stockpile yield, but it overall improved his yield overall over the year. And that is gonna help our stockpile yield. Yes, in measurement, his stockpile yield might be lower, but in actual terms, He's produced more forage in general and therefore affected his stockpile yield positively. So anytime we can add diversity to our pasture field, we ought to do it. Don't think about it as wasting grass. Never think about leaving grass behind you as wasting grass. You're doing a lot of things if you leave grass behind you. If it's standing forage, it's shading the soil. If it's trampled forage, it's going to feed the, the microbes and the soil health. Never think about it as wasting grass. Then I, I know uh, that I'm probably going to get some frowns from the fall and winter calving creep, but as much as, as we can, we need to work with nature, with our calving, with our finishing, with when we sell our calves. We need to work with nature, those high highs and those low lows, both in our, our needs and our production. We need to face our number hangups. Too often, I've talked a lot about getting our operations in, in balance forage-wise, but too often I go out and work with producers and I say, why do you have this many cows? And, and I'm guilty of this as anybody else. So don't think I'm picking on anyone. I'm, I'm totally using my own case in, in, in point here as a study. I have this many cows because I have a bull. And I keep 25 cows, 30 cows, whatever you say it is, per bull because that's, that's efficient. Well, no, I've actually done the math. And, and you're more efficient to have the number of cows that your, your farm will support, no matter how many it takes for a bull. I don't care if it's 10 cows, 20 cows, whatever you're more efficient to have the number of cows if you've got one or two more cows just because of a bull i guarantee you're not getting that much efficiency in buying one bull every couple of years uh, as, as you are in wasting forage or, or feeding stored forage because your operation is not in balance and then the last one we need to consolidate our herds too often i go out to, to producers and they've got multiple 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 herds they've got a herd of heifers and steers and cows and sick cows and limping cows and bulls and this and that and the other. And it's okay to have separate herds when we're trying to manage the spring flush. It actually helps. It's okay to have separate herds if we're feeding winter feeding other than the extra time and mud it takes to feed in the winter. Um, the, the, the needs of animals are different. And so if we need to keep them separate, that's fine. But when we're expecting 100% of our needs, our livestock needs to come from pasture, there is just no good reason to have them separate. We might as well have all the herds together. If we put all the herds together, that means we have a longer rest period. That means we're more efficient. That means we only go out there to move one group instead of two or three. <clears throat> and the picture you see here is about three days after I put our sheep flock and our cows together. Now they were still keeping pretty separated at that point, but that had made all the difference last summer in us managing our cow herd and managing our sheep herd by having them all together. <clears throat> well, that's a wrap for how to stockpile grass part one. As I recorded this presentation, I realized it was gonna be almost an hour long and I said, you know what, we need to split this in two just for those of you that are watching on YouTube so it's not such a long presentation all at one, one time and one sit down. So this part one, part two, we'll, we'll dive into some systems that I've sort of devised uh, that I think would help us to produce some more stockpile grass. While I'm on this slide though, I'll, I'll tell you that this picture here is of the same field I, I talked about earlier uh, that said I, I would show a picture of the seed heads after they've been mob grazed. So this was 60 days after this field had been mob grazed. You can see some seed heads still standing up there. Some of the other pictures I use later on in the presentation are 60 days after this. And, even more of those seed heads have disappeared. They've either been eaten or trampled. So I'll be looking for how to stockpile grass part two. And with that, I'll say we'll see you next time.